all separated from the government, uh, which means you are banned uh, from working for the federal government for the rest of your life. And so imagine if you moved to Washington and you're young and idealistic and you've come, because after World War II, Washington is the center of the world. You were rebuilding Europe and you've come to actually make the world a better place. And then for the rest, you get investigated and uh, designated as a sexual deviant. And your people, uh, the FBI wrote to people's families saying your child, is, your son or daughter is being investigated as a sexual deviant. They talked to their neighbors. So in a time when it was you know, totally devastating to be outed, the government was outing people and firing them. So for me, it was about the cello was always Tim, and the hawk was always the piano, and then you had the, the film quartet. And there was always a moment where I envisaged their main instruments coming together. So as their relationship develops, we then have the kind of beautiful cello playing the theme over the top. But you talk about the power struggle between politics. For me, it was always, it was a love story, but it was always about the power struggle, not just between Tim and Hawke, but between what's actually going on in Washington and the Carthys as well. And coming from Scotland, I didn't know that much about the actual history of it. So it was absolutely appalling, but also fascinating actually learning about it during the series. Discomfort is for but it's very rare in the shows. A lot of the time you get to write kind of 30, 40 second pieces of music on Donnie and Keys, we call them. In this, they're all like about three minute or more pieces, and half the time there's no dialogue going on, and it's music leading the way, and I'm in the mix saying, should we turn it down a bit? Which never happens with composers because the regos are out here. And Rob's like, no, 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 put it up, put it up. And we see that at the opening, there's kind of two minutes or whatever um, of just the music driving, and there's the dance going around, they're in the party, all of that. And the establishing the themes, the cutting between Hawk in the toilet and then going back to his other lives and stuff like that. It was always about music driving those scenes and it's really an immense privilege to be able to do that when you pick the instruments and then he just trusts you to go and do it and lead the way. It was fun to talk about when there would be a cue and when there wouldn't be a cue. <laughs> you know, you guys said that because Paul's was you were often the one who said you don't need a cue here. Yeah, I mean the acting is so amazing, um, but then there were just some cues. Again, going back to a lot of the people have asked about how do you go about scoring sex scenes because there are so many sex scenes. And again, Ron and I were discussing it earlier on and saying, well, in actual fact, I never saw them particularly as sex scenes, which I know sounds weird, but it, again, it was always about the power struggle about. Who's in charge? Is it Tim? Is it all? Oh, is that power struggle between them? So when Ron and I were talking about it, it was literally just a case of well, that's another scene in the overriding story. Um, but when we didn't have a cue, and the one that killed me was um, the toe sucking scene, which has become quite renowned. Ron, do you want to go first? Where was the inspiration? The inspiration for it. Um, I read about it in the books. So you can kind of say, look. There should be music here. I'm just like, it doesn't need music. It makes it feel a bit sentimental. It's a really full on scene, but it's very flirtatious as well. And again, it's the, it's the first part of the power struggle. So I was like, look, I'll try something out. And it just was the only thing I just I couldn't get. I nailed the sound of the show pretty quickly, I think. But that scene I just couldn't do. And so I'm like, well, look, there's a bit of double bass, there's a bit of that. And I just suddenly came across the bass flute. Now I don't know why. But just put it in and we were sat back watching it just then. And as soon as it came in, we were just like, oh, that's right. Oh, that comes in perfectly. Oh, that's great. And so uh, Kristen, my woodwind player, who's in Florida, she suddenly had a job for the episodes and was like, hey, can you play bass flute? Quick, I just need something to demo this up. And suddenly, bass flute is everywhere throughout this for the eight episodes. So we're like, yeah, it's cool. The toilet stop. I mean, with a, and I remember we had such a brilliant director, Dan Minahan, and our brilliant DP, Simon Dennis, who was supposed to be here tonight, could he be felt ill? Yeah, yeah. He was the uh, on the set because he's, he's, and he, it's funny that you, Paul, and Simon have a similar joyful, I don't want to say childlike because that's what you mean, but kind of like this thing. And Simon on the set is like, you were like, did you hear that? Yeah, he's like, he's running here and he's running there. He says, oh, I've got this great idea. So he's got that kind of joy. Which is really great. Um, but uh, that we, you know, Hawk bangs the, the guy's head against the toilet stall, and that's that's boom. It's almost like a 
and boom, the key sucks. And then we're in, we're in kind of a harsh, not a harsh, well, yeah, a harsh reality of a, a sex black that has a, a violence in it. Yeah. And that was well, just, and throughout the music side there, of this character in this scene. Because, you know, it's like, boom, it's like the harsh reality of, uh, and I, there's no judgment in that when I say that, but just that, that Hawkins, I think we're trying to establish Hawk as a potentially dangerous person for someone like Tim to fall in love with. And I would also say that that was, again, that was the point with the very fast music that you spoke about. It's not about love, it's about his animal instinct, and it's about that kind of dark edginess. And one of the things we spoke about at the end of all the sex scenes was how the hell do you bring it out? Because it's not this gentle emotion, it's very hard on heart. <laughs> one of the things you said to crack me up, and I can't remember which episode it was, but it's the same in all of them. It's the hard outs at the end of the scene. So it's then taken over by you know, him in the bedroom, kind of carrying on with sex or something else, or whatever. It's just with any. But it's about the hard outs, the punctuation marks, and it's the same throughout all of it. There's never a resolution, whether it's musically. What's the thing that you said about? How there was never a resolution in any of the scenes. The resolution is always. Yeah, we, I mean, yeah, we had we had certain rules. I have a lot of rules. One is that that every scene is about power, especially the sex scenes. And that's borrowing from Oscar Wilde, who said, you know, all, all, um, everything in life is about sex, except for sex. Sex is about power. But really, to, to take into a love story and say that everything is about power, and every scene has to move the story forward. If it doesn't move the story forward, it should. In there. So we so we never talk about sex scenes. We never said, "Hey, we're twenty minutes in. Let's show some skin." It was really about at this point, the characters. The characters had to change. They had to be in a different place in the story at the end of each scene. And then the this, this first sex scene between Hawk and Tim in the apartment. And actually, I think the cue did go over. I love this beautiful cue that, that he wrote, where they're sitting down to talk. They're facing each other, having a suit. And there's just that beautiful, and Tim is talking about a very, this, this, the concept of this first sexual uh, act, uh, interaction with a, a priest. And it's a very painful memory because the guy obviously hates himself for being homosexual that he is. And that beautiful cue, just, it just, there's something melancholy and yet beautiful about it. And then I think it comes down a little bit. It comes down, but then we, then boom, when they fall into bed, we're, and I, I think that we had a, I probably asked you for a cue there, but we eventually sort of said, you know, let's let the audience just feel, hear, sex, take the music out. And give it space, yeah. And again, that was something we said and chatted to you a wee bit earlier on as well, just about episode one of any show is always so hard. You're trying to find the themes, not just as a composer, but as a writer, as anything. You're trying to establish all that, get people into it, not give them information overload. So simply you're finding those themes, and at some stage, you've got to get the mixed or get into episode two and three and four and so on. But you get to episode three or four, whatever, you think, oh, that theme, now I've established it, now I know what I want. And as the sound then develops during a series, it's like the characters, isn't it? Then the characters develop, and you're suddenly with them, everybody, you've got to introduce them in that first couple of episodes. Well, I mean, obviously, you know, that, you know, I felt great freedom to do this, and there was never any pushback from um, any executives or anything. As a matter of fact, there, uh, Dante Di Loretto, who is the, is the president of Fremantle, which is the studio, said at one point, the sex scene should be so hot that straight men will want to have gay sex. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, you know, if you want to confirm or deny that scene or whatever. Um, but you know, that, was, that was the great rule, so we, we wanted to do that. And um, I think you know, we accomplished it. And that, but it has to do also with having these actors who come who, I mean, you know, you think about what acting is, and you know, there are like 50 people standing around watching you be intimate or cry and do all this stuff 10 times, 20 times, 30 times. And then, at, then how about being naked and simulating sexual acts? And it's so, it's the courage that it takes to be an actor is amazing. But, but all of our actors uh, came to give it, give it 100%. And I, I, we were talking about rules earlier, but. You know, one of the other rules, uh, this speaks, I think, your question, one of your questions, uh, is would there are no, no victims of power travels. So on the set, I'd say, no, no victims, we're not playing victims of oppression. You know, that's, that's not, you know, we are, we are human beings who are struggling. You know, and so it's a, a we, we wanted, we didn't want to, 
we can come to the center. Sure, I, you know, I, um, I love Mr. Mallon's novel, and I really recommend him. He's a great, he's a great writer. He's, his novel is limited almost exclusively to the 50s. There is a preface, though, at the beginning where we meet Hawk, about five pages we meet Hawk in 1991, and he gets a, a letter about Tim's fate, and Tim doesn't have the sign by AIDS. And the, that little thing made me think, um, Hawk runs 60, it established in a life as a father and a grandfather, that's fascinating. But what if, but if, you know, there's nothing interesting for us watching a, a character receive a letter. Uh, but what if Tim was not dead? And what if, so it's just, my mind just started going with that. So then I, I because AIDS was one of the formative experiences of my life in a personal way, I came out in 1977, 78, you know, had the great celebration. By the way, episode seven takes place entirely in 1979. And there's lots of sex, lots of drugs, lots of dancing, lots of time in summer. <laughs> and there's also the White Knight Rides in San Francisco. So you get the whole thing. And, uh, and that, that will tell you what my life was like in 1978. Something. But, um, but it, it, so personally, uh, and then AIDS came and you know, just changed all of us. And, uh, and then professionally, AIDS was a big part of my life. So I, I, I wanted to bring AIDS into it. And then I started thinking, well, if they're between those 33 years, well, did they see each other at another time? So we have episode six, 1968, we have episode seven, seven, 1979. So it was really just me loving these characters so much and wanting to see them. Like, it was like if you had a friend, you would want 33 years to go by and not seeing them, you want to say, like, check in every 10 years or so. So that's what we did. It helped us nail it down to 86 because the idea of getting to see Roy, Roy on, on, on this is spoiler alert, but when you get to the finale episode, you, you, you get to see Roy Cohn on television doing one of his interviews where he says, like, the idea that anyone think of me as homosexual is completely ridiculous. And first, and somebody says, Are you dying of AIDS? And I, I mean, you kind of have, have to love Roy, so to speak. He says, A, I'm not dying of nothing, and B, I don't have AIDS. Um, yeah, it was very important to us. Also, for younger people, like, oh my god, it must have been so oppressive. And I said, we had fun. Oh my god, the game was set 1978. It was like fucking fantastic. Uh, you know, and just having sex with everybody you met. Uh, um, again, episode seven. Uh, but, and also, but in the 50s, as you see, there are people who will always find a way, and that is something people say about the movement and everything. I say, find joy in the struggle. Yes. That's we have to find joy in the struggle because we're always in the struggle. We're always going to be the outsider in a way, and you'll but you find joy in the struggle. And we, I think, we have fun and joy, and sex is actually a source, <laughs> can be a source of joy. So I hear.